can't break my streak of introducing people. Okay, for our uh, more advanced level presentation tonight, I guess I'm going to be uh, doing a talk on Unicode. Um, I've called it Unicode Fundamentals, uh, because even though this is a more uh, advanced talk, I just assume that you understand immediately things like hex values and stuff like that. Um, the idea of Unicode and text processing and stuff is pretty simple and basic, and like string is a built-in type in Python, right, in a lot of languages. So uh, it's it's very fundamental, and yet a lot of people struggle with it and have problems with it, and that includes me. Until recently, to my shame, I wasn't very good at this Unicode stuff, and so when I learned about it, I thought it was very important to uh, tell other people about it. There's also a famous article by Joel Spolsky online about Unicode and developers not understanding Unicode. It's a shame. Um, and it is a shame, and I think it persists because there are some languages and tools and stuff that kind of are loosey goosey with it. And you don't really need to understand Unicode, you can just sort of sort of write code, uh, and it will all kind of work most of the time, and then just break suddenly on Unicode characters. Uh, so it's sad that these languages encourage that, uh, but unfortunately, among those languages is good old Python 2. Um, and so, um, that also leads into the fact that though we try to focus on Python 3 at these meetings, I'm going to be talking about Python 2 and Python 3 in this presentation, so I can tell you how things are kind of different between them and how things got better with Python 3. Uh, but I, before I get that far, first I want to ask a question. So how many of you in the audience either have trouble with the Unicode concepts or have been bitten by Unicode problems in the past? Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, so many people. I'm surprised it's not everybody. Yeah. Good old uh, Unicode decode error, could not decode with, with codec ASCII, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's the error that we all have seen. Uh, yeah, it's tough, it sucks, and Python 2 makes it easier to make that kind of mistake. Uh, but I'll get to that. So let's go way back, first of all, way, way back to the beginning, or maybe not the very beginning, I don't know, the 80s or something, as Steve was saying, when nobody had to worry about Unicode and everything was ASCII. Uh, in the beginning, there was ASCII. ASCII was all you needed to represent te text. Um, I'm not sure if it was the only encoding, actually. There have always been lots of encodings, but it was kind of a standard. Uh, it's a 7-bit encoding, which is kind of weird, but I, I hear this is because this is from when computers used weird numbers of bits for everything. Nowadays, everything is done in 8-bit bytes, uh, and we don't have 7-bit units, so um, when people encode ASCII values, they tend to just, they use the seven least significant bits and the most significant one is just set to zero. So we have an extra bit that's not used by ASCII, which created, which is tempting for people and created problems eventually. Uh, so here's the, the ASCII code table. Um, you'll see the first 20, or X20 values uh, look blank, but they're not blank, they're just not printable. So there's stuff that, all, all of these are used by ASCII, but it only contains these non-printable characters and then letters and numbers and some punctuation and stuff. Uh, so that's good enough for English and like and, and basic text display in English, but unfortunately, what happens if you don't speak just English uh, or you need something else that's not found in ASCII? Well, I mentioned that that most significant bit um, and how tempting it is because if you use that bit, you get an extra 128 combinations. So people started using that bit. The only problem is that there was no standard, or if there was, people didn't care. They just invented their own. So eventually, there were lots of standards uh, for using those bytes. Um, hex AD to hex FF. Uh, one example is ISO 8859-1, also known as ISO Latin 1. It uh, defines encodings in that range for some Latin characters, like regular English letters with accents and stuff like that, and some other weird characters that I don't really know what they are. Um, so that's great for, for languages that are just kind of like Englishy with accents, but what about like Chinese that has you know thousands of characters? We can encode that just using 256 options, so we're forced to go through two schemes that use multiple bytes uh, for one character. And so we have encodings like shift gis for Japanese characters and so forth. So the point of all this is to say that there never really was one way to encode text. There's always been lots of ways. So if you look at a string of bytes with values in them, do you know what text it is? Even if it looks like ASCII? No, you do not. You do not know unless somebody tells you. That's the first lesson to learn. You just don't know. Uh, so let's forget about that problem for a minute, and what about the problem, now that we have all these different encodings, like we have one encoding for Japanese and we have one encoding for Russian and stuff, and that's fine as long as we keep track, you know, this file is encoded this way, uh, so we know which characters these bytes represent. We know they're Russian characters, not Japanese or whatever, but what happens if we want to combine text from different languages, or quote one uh, source in one language and another source or something like that? Um, 
or compare two different encodings that kind of define the same characters, but they're in different places. We want to know, like, is this X entity equal to that X entity or something like that. We could start going crazy and defining all sorts of conversion routines from encoding A to encoding B and so on, but that's a crazy solution. It doesn't scale. Um, you have to define one routine for every combination of two different encodings. So it'd be really nice if we had sort of one standard gigantic character set with every character, and we could just say, uh, for all these crazy different encodings, we would just have to define um, where in this gigantic space of characters the, this, the characters in this specific encoding fit. And that's what the Unicode standard does. Unicode, Unicode is a, a whole standard and incorporates lots of different things. It's not just, it's not just uh, one thing, it's not just one character set, but the universal character set is defined by the Unicode standard. Um, and it represents characters uh, as code points, or rather it associates this concept of a code point to every single character in the character set. And a code point is basically just a number, sort of like a byte is a number, but actually totally different. It's, uh, you shouldn't consider a code point to be made up of bytes, it's just a number that's associated with the character. Every character in the, in the universal character set has a code point associated with it, and there are over a million of these code points available, so that's enough so far for every language. Uh, that we have on Earth, so we can just put all of the different characters and all these crazy languages we use in a different part of this code space, and it all, all fits together. Uh, and we can, in the same source uh, of text, we can have Russian and French and Japanese and everything, and it all works, which is great. Um, unfortunately, though, our disks and our networks and our databases and memory don't work based on storing code points, they store bytes. So we're left with the question, how do we encode, how do we represent these code points uh, in terms of strings of bytes? And the unfortunate answer, but necessary answer, is that there isn't just one way. There are multiple ways. So there are multiple different ways to encode Unicode code points as sequences of bytes. So here's, here's one example to illustrate the concept of code points and encodings and bytes. We have on the top this sort of abstract floaty idea of a character associated with its code point. In this case, it's a regular old character that is actually in ASCII, the letter A. Uh, this letter A has a number associated with it, which is the code point, but that's almost not really important what that number is. Its only role is to represent the idea of the character, lowercase English letter A. So we have that sort of concept on top, and then at the bottom, we have different byte sequences that can be used to represent this character. And the byte sequence that you would use depends on the encoding that you're thinking of using to represent the character. So for example, uh, well, A is kind of boring, actually, because if we use the ASCII encoding, um, the byte that we use is hex 61. And if we use the encoding called UTF-8, um, which I'll explain a little more later, I think, it's also hex 61. So what's, what's going on here? Well, there's, there's also an encoding UTF-16, where the fundamental um, representational unit is two bytes long, 16 bits long. And in that case, we have an extra null, null byte at the beginning because we have to use the whole 16 bits. Um, so even with good old ASCII characters, you can't assume that just because you see something, you see hex 61 in a file, it's the ASCII character A because it could be UTF-16, for example. Um, so the fundamental, even though this diagram is kind of boring because it's an ASCII, about an ASCII character, the thing that you sh should already be able to take away is that the encoding of text is not something that's fundamentally attached to the bytes on disk or that you get across a network. It's not attached to the bytes. It's something that you use to go between bytes and code points. It's an extra bit of information. It's not fundamentally associated with anything. Um, so it's something that you have to be told or if you're writing something in specific encoding, you have to tell the person who's reading it what that encoding is. Otherwise, they, they either have to come up with a really complicated, fancy program to guess that encoding or they just don't know and they might get it wrong. Let's do a more complicated example. Here we have uh, the letter E with the acute accent on it. Again, this has a code point, which is a number, but I won't tell you what that number is because it's not really important. And here's some different encodings that we can use to translate between that abstract idea of a character and its code point and bytes, hard bytes on a disk. Uh, if we use isolatin 1, we get a single byte, hex E9. If we use UTF-8, something interesting happens, which is that the representation uh, you remember that the UTF-8 representation of A was just one byte long. For the E with the acute accent, it's actually two bytes. And it's nothing like E9, it's C3 and then hex A9. So completely, completely different. And then, if we try to use ASCII, um, 
to convert from the code point to bytes on disk, uh, there's no valid, if you try to do that in like in a programming language or something, it's either an error or you have to replace it with some character because that character doesn't exist in the ASCII, uh, in the ASCII table. It's not an ASCII character. And you see there's no arrow coming back from the bytes to that code point through ASCII because there's no byte that could possibly represent that, that character in ASCII. So that's the fundamental idea. Code points and bytes, they're different things. There's lots of different ways to go between bytes and code points and you need to know what way was used in order to perform that translation. If you didn't get that the first time, that's fine because I'm gonna go over pretty much all this again, only this time in the context of Python. Let's start with Python 2. So Python 2, what do we have here as far as data types uh, go? We have, first of all, the good old stir type. Stir is if you make a string literal with quotes in your source code, this is what it will default to. A stir is an uh, eight bit string or a, or a string of bytes, basically. Uh, as I said, you can define a uh, string literal in your code, it will be an eight bit string. Uh, they're not ASCII strings, you might be tempted to think of them that way, but they're not really, because if they were just strictly ASCII strings, um, for example, using any bytes outside of that range that I showed you from 0 to 127 would be illegal because they're not ASCII values. But as you can see here in this example, uh, the second string I type in, I, literally, I force each, um, I explicitly type out each byte value, uh, bytes 62, 72, 10, and ff, and you can see that they're all legal to include in the string. I didn't get any sort of error, even though they're not all ASCII values. And at, you can see at the end, ff, which is definitely not an ASCII value, it dutifully puts it into the string and it will print it out, although it can't display it as a character because it's not an ASCII character, so it just gives me the byte value. But the point is that these strings contain bytes. They're literally just byte holders, and for convenience, they will, like, I, I explicitly put hex 62 into the string, and when, I, when it echoed it back at me, it replaced that with a B, because that's the, the code for ASCII letter B. So just by convenience, it will show you bytes that are ASCII characters, it will print them out as ASCII characters. But they just store bytes in Python 2. By default, the default string type stores bytes, because Python was originally created a long time ago before Unicode was really a thing. And so uh, Python 2, that's what you get by default in a string. Um, so here's the next lesson, or maybe sort of a variation on the first lesson that you can't tell uh, what bytes are unless you know what the encoding is. Bytes are not text, and you can't use, if you have a stir in Python, this might sound surprising, you can't treat it as text for the purposes of text processing. And that sounds very crazy considering the fact that this is the default string type in Python 2, but it's true. You can't use it for text processing. You can, uh, you can until you can't. <laughs> if some, when you, when you get to certain more complicated scenarios, it stops working. So I'm going to, oh yeah, and before I show you uh, what problems can occur, um, in Python 2 especially, uh, well, devices like uh, the terminal the user types into or reading from a file or getting stuff from across the network, um, those devices, they deal in bytes, right? And in Python 2 especially, the APIs tend to give you uh, bytes back. That is, they give you stir um, values. Unless, unless an API specifically tells you it gives you Unicode, you can assume it gives you this kind of string. So let's see the consequences of this uh, using the innocent raw input function. Here, I'm getting the user's name using raw input, and they enter their name is Andre with that E with the acute accent. And then I want to tell this person, Andre, how many letters are in his name. So I say, uh, your name has six letters in it. Except it doesn't have six letters. Because what's happened here is that some mysterious thing has happened with the terminal device, and it's translated that E with the acute accent into two bytes. And raw input returns a stir, which is a byte string. And so I've gotten back a string with six bytes in it, and I measured the length, and when you measure the length of a, of a stir, it gives you the number of bytes. So it, again, this is a reflection of the fact that a stir is not text, it's bytes, raw bytes. Uh, this is where this can really um, bite you. Uh, uh, so let's say, this is an expanded example where I'm actually showing the encoding of the terminal device that's giving us this user's name. In the first example, the encoding is UTF-8. Um, and so I get his name and then I print out the bytes that are in that, are in that string. And um, this is what happened in that first example. You can see there's two bytes at the end for the E with the acute accent. If you remember way back, the encoding for the E with the acute accent in UTF-8 is two bytes. And it's those bytes, C3 and A9. Uh, and in the second example, he's using a terminal with a different encoding. It's ISO Latin 1. 
And so in this case, he puts in the same thing. He puts in Andre, but now the terminal device has converted that into a different set of bytes. So now the E with the acute accent is a different thing. It's just one byte. So if I did the previous example now here uh, with this sort of terminal, I would say his name is five characters. But uh, more importantly, say I store, I was doing something a little silly, and I was storing these byte strings in a database, say, to record a username. And the user tried to log in. Let's say I recorded it with the first example, and then he tried to log in in the system in the second example, and I compare the two byte strings. They're not the same. So I'd say, oh, no, this username doesn't exist, uh, when obviously it does. So you can't treat, again, you can't treat these byte strings as text. Uh, you need to know the encoding. And if different code encodings are used and you try to compare text, things will not go well for you. So anyway, that's, that's byte strings and why they're not text in Python 2 uh, or anywhere, I guess. Uh, all, Python 2, though, does have Unicode support. It has full Unicode support. It's just that it's not the default. Uh, the type for Unicode strings is Unicode in Python 2. If you want to make a Unicode string literal, you put a U before it. So U, quote, string literal. String literal. And Unicode is used. It's a sequence of code points, and it's used to represent text for text processing purposes. Uh, and the dance that we do is that if you have a Unicode object, you call its encode method and you give an encoding like UTF-8 or ASCII or whatever, and it will give you a stir object back, which is a string of bytes. And if you have a string of bytes, you can decode that back into Unicode if you know the encoding. But if you don't know the encoding and use the wrong one, you might get wrong values or you might get an error. So here's some quick examples of how that works. Uh, if we encode Unicode hello into UTF-8, it comes back as bytes hello. So those are not the, strain, the same despite how similar they look. A Unicode string is not the same as a string of bytes. It just happens that in this case, uh, uh, they're all ASCII characters. Um, if we have Unicode Andre, this is just echoing the previous example with Ryan, but I explicitly, this time I have the Unicode literal Andre, and I encode it with UTF-8, and it comes back. There's two bytes you can see for the last character. Then I encode it with isolatin one, and there's only one byte. You've already seen that. Uh, the final example, I tried to encode it with ASCII, and even though ASCII is a valid encoding for Unicode text, it only encodes um, Actually, ISO Latin one is, is the same, but ASCII it encodes an even more restricted set of code points. Uh, it encodes only the first 127 code points of Unicode. So I get an error because the E with the accent is not an ASCII character. And it tells me exactly what went wrong. It tried to encode it into bytes with the ASCII codec, and it couldn't do this particular byte, which was, um, or sorry, this particular code point, which was hex E9. Here's all those previous examples in reverse. Uh, Again, I tried to, uh, now I'm converting from bytes to Unicode. Uh, you can see the various Andres decoded according to their appropriate codec. Uh, the last example, I, I put a, the byte 80 into a, a string, which as I've said many times is not a valid. Uh, uh, it doesn't represent a, any character in ASCII, so if I try to decode that with the ASCII codec, this time I get a decode error, and it tells me which byte it wasn't able to do. So let's get to the important part, which is where the Unicode confusion happens in Python 2. This is something that I haven't tried to do yet. I was trying to encode Unicode strings into bytes, and I was trying to decode bytes into Unicode strings, as is right and good and proper. Um, here, I'm trying to decode a Unicode string, which is dumb, right? It sounds dumb because it's already decoded. It's already been decoded from bytes. But Python will let you. Do, Python two will let you do this, um, which seems kind of silly and crazy. Like here, I'm I'm decoding the Unicode hello with UTF-8, and it comes back the same. So maybe you might think, well. Maybe it's a little bit smart and it just knows it's already Unicode, so it just does nothing to the string. But the second example, you see that can't be the case because it doesn't just echo back what I gave it, it gives me an error. And the error is crazy and doesn't make any sense. Um, I try to decode with UTF-8 and it's saying Unicode encode error with the ASCII codec, which is completely not what I asked for. So uh, you might be thinking, what the heck? I don't understand what could possibly be happening. And generally this is a point where you, well, I don't know what you, this is the point where I just start typing encode, decode everywhere in the code, <laughs> trying to get the permutation that makes everything work right, right? That's a sure way to make yourself go crazy. So what's happening here? What's happening is that Python 2 is doing something really weird. Like Python, normally we think of as this very strongly typed language. It doesn't want to implicitly convert between types if it doesn't have to, right? But for whatever reason, I guess they decided when they added Unicode support to Python 2, they decided that it was too hard, if people were mostly going to use ASCII anyway, it was too hard to force people to do this explicitly all the time. So Python 2, if it detects that you're trying to do something with a Unicode object, um, uh, sorry, with a, you're trying to do something, yeah, to a Unicode object that really should be done to a plain old stir object, it will implicitly, behind the scenes, convert that Unicode to a stir. 
Uh, but how does it do that? Because as, as I've said like a million times already, you need to specify the encoding. There's not just one way to do this. And the way it does this is using the system default encoding, and the system default encoding is ASCII in Python 2, which is sad. But um, the effect of this is that if everything in your Python 2 program is ASCII, then this probably won't bite you because all the characters are just in ASCII anyway. So if these implicit conversions go on in the background, uh, your program won't care. But as soon as you throw a Unicode uh, character in there that's not in ASCII, you start getting problems because some implicit conversion will happen and um, behind the scenes it will try to convert to or from ASCII and it will fail. So what's happened in this case is I've called decode, I'll go back to the example, I've called decode on a Unicode object, but Python has said, wait a minute, decode gets called on stir objects. So I'm going to implicitly convert this Unicode Andre um, to a sequence of bytes using the ASCII codec and then I will do what you asked, which is to decode it. But it doesn't get to that point because it tries to encode it first implicitly with the ASCII codec, and you can't do that. So that's why the error is an encode error, and that's why it says the ASCII codec is the one. So that's pretty sad, and eventually, I guess Guido and everybody decided that was a big problem. And so in Python 3, this is all different. What does Python 3 do? Uh, well, first of all, Python 3 still has a Unicode string type and a byte string type. It's just that now they're named a little bit differently. So stir in Python 3 is what Unicode was, basically, in Python 2. And bytes in Python 3 is basically kind of, sort of more or less, what stir is in uh, Python 2. So if you want something that is just a string of bytes in Python 3, you literally call it bytes. It's very specific. This string contains bytes. Uh, and a plain old stir is, is text in the rich sense. It's Unicode text. Uh, and now string literals are Unicode by default. And if you specifically want a byte string, you have to prefix it with B. So the encode decode dance in Python 3 is the same. It's the same idea, you encode, uh, this time stir, but it's the Unicode object, right? You encode Unicode objects into strings of bytes and you decode bytes into Unicode objects. Uh, the important point is that stir.decode doesn't exist and bytes.encode doesn't exist because those don't make sense. And there's no implicit conversion anymore, which is the next slide. No automatic string coercion. Uh, Python 3 is a more strongly typed language because we don't do this anymore, we don't allow it. If you try to mix, like if you try to concatenate, for example, a bytes object and a stir object, it will simply not let you say type error in these objects. I think the error message is very specific. It says can't concatenate, you know, bytes and stir or whatever. So, yeah, Python 3 is great. It won't let you just sort of write your code, uh, not caring about whether your strings are Unicode or bytes, um, because at the first sign of you trying to combine the two, it will say it's an error. Whereas Python 2 will happily go along and just convert everything behind the scenes until something's not asking, and then it'll blow up. Okay, so what's the upshot of all this? What should you do about Unicode and Python? Well, step one is a learning step. It's not a coding step. You need to know uh, at every point in your program. You need to understand the difference between text and bytes, and you need to know in your program what you have at any one point. Uh, again, in Python 2, generally, if you use the standard library anyway, a lot of things will give you bytes, and you'll have to explicitly convert it from bytes to Unicode objects. Uh, some some library, like packages and stuff will do the conversion for you, which is nice, but not always. But you have to know, you can't just mix them. Python 2 will let you until you get Unicode and then your program will crash and Python 3 will not let you. Um, take, in, take in bytes wherever you have to from files and devices and the network and stuff like that, but convert it to Unicode immediately. Unless you have some sort of crazy performance problem limitation where this is not possible, just convert to Unicode, everything will be in that one gigantic universal character set and you'll be able to do comparisons and not have to worry about something being in some encoding and another thing being in a different encoding. Just convert to Unicode internally, and then if you have to write stuff out or send stuff out at the boundaries of your program, again, convert back to bytes. Always know what encoding you're using. Uh, UTF-8 is kind of emerged as a standard um, because it combines sort of efficiency with the fact that it can encode everything in Unicode. Uh, but the important, more important point than using UTF-8 is to know what you're using and tell other people because they need to use it to decode your data. Uh, finally, you have to test with Unicode non-ASCII characters in your program, whether you're using Python 2 or Python 3, because Python 3, even if you're, you're good and you don't mix stir and Unicode, you might have a encode or decode at some point that's using the wrong, um, that's using the wrong encoding, and uh, you'll get a crash if you try to use non-ASCII characters with it. So um, here's a really good idea, and it's not my idea, it's other people's idea, but it's a good idea. Use crazy Unicode characters that are not ASCII characters but still kind of look like them so that when you test with it, you can kind of read it and if it comes out at some point 
in your program, like in your web application in HTML or something, as unreadable garbage, you know you screwed up at some point. Um, so it'll be really obvious. They're Unicode characters that are so easy to read, so it's really obvious to tell if you screwed up at any point. So that's all I have. Um, the other really important talk to watch uh, or read if you need to understand this stuff is Ned Batchelder's talk at PyCon 2012, Pragmatic Unicode or How Do I Stop the Pain? Um, it's pretty, I mean, all Unicode presentations are pretty similar, but this is sort of a more expanded, detailed presentation, mainly because he had uh, more time more time to do it in. But it's really super, super great, uh, and it will explain everything uh, in complete and total depth. That's all I have, and I'll be happy to take questions. Chardet to automatically detect character encodings. Um, I have not myself like explicitly used Chardet. I know that the requests module um, apparently will use, so if it, it, when it's making a request and it receives a response, it will look at the headers in the response to find the encoding of the response and then use that, that encoding. But if, it, if that, uh, yeah, if the encoding is not present, it will use Chardet behind the scenes to try to guess it. So in that sense, I have maybe sort of Used it as I don't know if I've ever needed to use it because most servers are correct about the encodings or will return the encodings. But yeah, that's the only sense in which I've really used it. I haven't I haven't worked with the API directly. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's more of a comment. Uh, I've actually used Chardet to like uh, Just about the, uh, the importance of our always understanding when you have to encode and when you have to decode. That's really, uh, for me, that the thing about Python 2 where both STIR and Unicode have encode and decode methods. Uh, the, the, the big downside of that for me is not so much the fact that, well, it's the fact that w when I try to remember which I have to do on which type, you go and you look at the, use dir on the type or whatever, and you see that both are there. So dir doesn't help you because you can see you can do both of them, even though one is really the one that you almost always want to do, and the other one is just there because of this weird interoperability between them that is not super helpful. So yeah, in Python 3, you can do dir on a, on a stir and see that there's only encode, and inversely for bytes. So yeah, not only is it saner behavior in Python 3, but it's more self-documented. Any more questions? I'm guessing you have these slides posted. Yes, we will put up these slides uh, in a couple days. And hopefully the video that turns out. Probably the best explanation I've seen in a long time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ned's, Ned's is super great too. I think it's better. And just that, I guess, one comment. I'm new to Python. It's, uh, we have the same kind of grief with Unicode. Uh, particular when you need to know the number of characters on a screen versus the number of bytes in the screen. Because mm -hmm. right? the Unicode, yeah, it could be two, three, and four characters, four bytes for one character. And so yeah. you're dealing with arrays. Yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah. If you don't have a native, uh, so the problem there, I guess, is that there isn't really a Unicode type in C unless you uh, get it from somewhere, right? Yeah. Built in. Yeah, so that it's the problem of knowing characters. You have a string of bytes, but how many characters is it? That's actually, I should say, that's a problem even in languages with the Unicode type like Python. I haven't, I didn't get there, but there, there is something in Unicode, like there's a feature in Unicode that uh, creates these combining characters. So there's such thing in Unicode as there's like a character that is the acute accent, not attached to any letter. It's just the accent. And if you combine that, with a letter like E, it will display on the screen a letter E with the accent. So that's two Unicode code points and only one character. So even in Unicode, you can't escape it. Even in Unicode, you need more advanced logic to be able to tell I have this many code points, how many characters. It I mean, it, it probably depends on the, the uh, behavior in the language. In Python, though, when I say that a Unicode string is a string of code points, that's literally what it is. So if you have two code points, the letter and the accent, we'll say the length of that string is two, even though it's one glyph on the screen. 
So yeah, it's still a problem. It's Unicode, I mean, it's helpful, but it's also, the old problems are still with us. On that same topic, uh, the Unicode data I didn't get there, and I'm not going to go through them all. But um, yeah, so it's it's the, the question or comment is, is about um, the Unicode data module and the normalization functions. You can use them to quick sort of thirty second description. You can use them to either compress together or pull apart Unicode strings. So if there are characters that are a combination of like letters and accents, you can either blow them all apart into the maximum number of code points, or if you have multiple code points, as I said, like with the E with the accent, if you have two code points for that, you'll compress them into one code point. The problem, like, that's, it's definitely, like, normalization is definitely a useful thing, but even there, there's still problems, because I know if you read the spec, there are some characters for, like, backwards compatibility reasons or whatever, you can try to normalize using the, the compression version, they, even though they have compressed equivalents, it won't compress them because of historical reasons. It's a huge, it's a huge, I mean, it's still a huge mess. <laughs> Text processing is still a huge mix, but um, yes, uh, thanks for mentioning the Unicode data module and the normalization functions. If anyone has detailed questions about that whole mess, you can maybe ask me afterwards, because it's a whole other kind of works. Aside from that, anything else? Doesn't look like it? Okay, thanks very much.